My name is Svein Matheson. I'm going to talk to you today about effect of climate change on indigenous communities in the Arctic. I'm working for the UArctic Erlat Institute in Norway, uh, in the Sami community, which is situated in the red circle, as you see on the map. Uh, here there are 3,000 Sami people living, uh, 1,500 are engaged in reindeer herding, herding all as much as 100,000 reindeer in a nomadic system, a nomadic grazing system. There are many indigenous nations in the Arctic. Only in the Russian Siberia is more than 24 different nations. In addition, we have Greenland, we have the Northern America. And of course, we have Samiland in Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Russia, where I'm living. But in this lecture, I'm going to tell you, give you some ex examples. I'm going to give you some examples from reindeer husbandry. Uh, later on in the week, we are going to discuss different effects on other indigenous peoples. Uh, other effect of climate change on the indigenous people's livelihood. But in this talk, I will talk about Sami reindeer herders and Evian reindeer herders in northern Sakyakutia in eastern Siberia. Snow has, from the very early morning, been important for the indigenous people's economy, for migration, for grazing conditions, um, and so on. Likewise, ice, ocean ice and snow has been very important for the livelihood, culture, traditional knowledge and the well-being of the people living here. So when the ice and snow is melting, it affects the indigenous communities. Like here in Siberia, the Nanets Reindeer Camp in Yamal, they are affected by the ongoing warming of the Arctic. Here, from my village, here in northern Norway, in Samiland, reindeer herders have to feed the reindeer every winter. Just some few ten years ago, that was impossible. So what's happened? What's happened with the indigenous community and why? In 2002, I was very fortunate to meet Professor Jim McCarthy, you see Jim McCarthy to the left in this picture in his office at Harvard. Unfortunately, he died one year ago in December. And as a memorial of him and his engagement, we are making this seminar for indigenous leaders about climate and knowledge systems. He allowed reindeer herders to participate in assessments about the change of the Arctic, together with Dr. Robert Corell on the right-hand side. You will meet Dr. Corell later this week. Jim McCarthy, uh, uh, together with Corell, initiated the Arctic Climatic Impact Assessment, but is mandated by the Arctic Council. And the conclusion was, already in 2004, was that Arctic is warming and will continue to warm. This figure uh, with the red and yellow shows plus 2 degrees to plus 12 degrees air temperature increase in the Arctic areas for the next 100 years. And you see, those areas which are very much red is actually the homeland of indigenous peoples communities. So already in 2004, McCarthy and Corell concluded that indigenous people are affected. That's some years ago. But the very early sign of a warming of the Arctic was reported in the New York Times um, in 1968. Here, from northern Norway, from Samilan, it says 30,000 reindeer died because of starvation, because the ice condition became so difficult for those 100,000 reindeer that actually they were dying. People were suffering. And you see the, the, 
director of Reindeer Husbandry, Harald Anstad, he actually in 1968 expressed his worry very severely of this hard frozen snow and how it's affect the reindeer and the people's economy. Just a few years ago we modulated. How did the snow pack look like in 1967-68? And you see here the snow came in October and disappeared in late May. And it was not so much snow, almost one meter of snow. But a very characteristic of a bad winter is the blue color. Down to the earth you have a solid very dense layer of ice and that layer of ice was developed already in November. We will talk with my colleagues about traditional knowledge. In that period the phenomenon Nyatsu is coming and determined this winter. It was a very bad winter and all these 30 animals died just in this village. 30,000 animals 1968. Do we have some other sign of effect of climate change here in the Sami community. Yes, this is here. If you look in the background on the left hand side you see the church here in this village. And that picture is taken in 1882. Last September I went to the right exact spot, 2020, and took the same picture. And you see the forest. We have a forestification of the tundra, which makes it very, very difficult. So the birch forest grows. The reason is that air temperature and CO2 in the atmosphere here is increasing. And this figure shows that half a degree is matter. You see, for the last 10,000 years, half a degree is increase means that the Norse, the Vikings of Norway, and Iceland went to Greenland, while half a degree reduction in air temperature is what we call the little ice age in Europe, affecting the community and the well-being. Today we are heading uh, towards, uh, in many communities, as high as six degrees. The global community in the Paris Agreement has agreed about two degrees. So the system here in the Arctic, you see the, the map I showed you previously, the system is very sensitive, it's very little increase affecting the communities and the environment. This grouse is a little bit more difficult, but not so difficult. On the right hand side you see that the increase in air temperature will take place in north and east. That means where I am living. I'm living in the middle of the very, very red, dark area here. That's where you have a major part of the reindeer in Norway. So it's not in Oslo, in southern Norway, but here in the north we have more, almost one degree increase per 10 year. The consequence of that is that actually, since 1920, air temperature here in the spring from March, April and May has in average increased with 3.7 degrees already, not 2 degrees as Paris talked about. The consequent is that snow is melting. So the season of the snow on the ground became shorter, actually 2 to 3 weeks shorter. You see here from the 1960s to today. Uh, this affect the welfare of the reindeer and the economy of the indigenous people. Likewise, you all have heard about albedo, how the snow is important in reflecting the sunshine back to the atmosphere. This is shown nicely in this picture, that the ice and snow is reflecting the energy. Disappearance of the snow makes the energy in the sun to be absorbed and the trees like the burst trees, as I show you, to, to grow. The main consequences is that bad grazing year due to snow and ice condition has increased in the summerland for reindeer. This shows that in the past there's always been bad grazing years. But you see here the frequency and the magnitude of the bad grazing year called Gowi. 
uh, is increasing. So you have a clear effect of the warming already. So what do we do about that? How can we handle that? Is the indigenous people, are they able to mitigate the carbon release? Pretty much no. But look at this. This is a herd about four, five thousand reindeer on migration route to the coast. And in the back you see a hydroelectric pole line. The industrial development in the Sami reindeer herders land is the most important uh, factor which affects the herders ability to adapt to this warming. Likewise, soon we will have copper mines in the reindeer herders pastures here on the coast. This is summer and calving area for many thousand on reindeer and the world need copper but the reindeer needs the pasture. And we have made this graph. Here you see on the left hand side all development until 2011 and on the right all development uh, which is planned for the future. Even the railway going into Finland. And you see that a lot of these industrial development make fragments eating its way into the reindeer pastures. And if this continues, black uh, is loss of grazing land, is called a globium model for predicting loss of grazing land. Green is untouched grazing land for reindeer. We see that the Scandinavian countries is very bad. Already 30% of the pastures for reindeer is lost. Permanently lost. It's not, it's not possible to get it back because of industrial development. So when you talk about climate change and indigenous people, you talk about multiple drivers of change. There's different factors affecting the people at the same time. And maybe that's why uh, the late Professor Jim McCarthy said, so I, you have to remember a lot of the indigenous people are hit more than once. It's not only about climate change, but they hit uh, in because the global uh, globalization of the world makes the, all this action going north for development. In IPCC, the UN climate report, it was very clearly concluded a couple of years ago. Protection of grazing land will be the most important adapted strategy for the reindeer herders under climate change. So that's important. Adaptation to climate change means protection of the pastures if you are going to adapt when the grazing condition gets bad because of the snow. So that's the Sami land. We are going to move all the way to eastern Siberia. This is as far as Tokyo, but it's up in the Siberia in the Republic of Sakaikutia. It's a place called Cheske where a lot of indigenous people are living. Yokagir, Ewen and Chukchi. And it's the coldest place on earth where people are living permanently. I usually call it the fourth pole. You have the North Pole, South Pole, Himalaya and Sakayakutia. So here you have a unique knowledge about adaptation. Adaptation to what's happening with the snow and ice is freezing and when it's melting. That's the kind of knowledge we need to develop and use in the planning of the society in the future. This is two colleagues of me. You will see them here at the course at Harvard. This is uh, Alona Gerasima, a Venker reindeer herder, working with us. And Jelena Antipa, Antipina, she is the rector at the Chesky School of Reindeer Husbandry. It was very cold in this picture. It's taken by me. I think it was minus 50 below. Very, very cold. But you see, when you look at the record of, of spring, air temperature. This is mean air spring temperature, March, April and May, from 1970 to today. You not talk about this 3 degrees, 3.7 degrees here in Norway. We don't talk about 2 degrees as Paris, but close to 7 degrees increase already. 7 degrees already. And here you have about 30,000 reindeer. You have communities, the oldest people Reminding, remaining of old people is 30 years, 30,000 years here. 
So indigenous people have been living here for 30,000 years. And this is happening now. And the consequences here, here is Yelena, the rector, my dear friend, and in Chesky, because of the warming, uh, the ice is open, air uh, precipitation of the ocean makes it to snow. Yes, it's still cold, but the ocean is open, so there will be a lot of snow while it's still warming. You know, so animals are dying, starving. This is a pasture, this is a structure herd. You see the reindeer in the background? And this is three of my colleagues, two reindeer herders and a PhD from Tromsø, uh, studying the grazing conditions in Chesky. These kind of changes change the snow and makes it very difficult for the reindeer to survive. This is just one example. Another example is what's going on in the summer. While it's warm, uh, cold in the winter, it's very warm in the summer. In Sakya the number of forests and tundra fires has increased enormously. Even in the cities, you see on the top, that's Yakutsk. That's the main city of Sakya About one million people living in this huge territory, five times the area of France, is burning. And here you see, in a recent paper made by us, a huge group of colleagues, very soon to be published, shows that the number of fires, Tundra forest fires, has increased from 150 to 2,000, more than 2,000 in some few years. And we have found the reason for these fires is based, is due to the to the thunderstorms. So there is a connection between weather, dry May and June, and those enormous fires affecting people's well-being. You can't breathe, actually, but also damaging the postures. What about the future? We have done something called statistical downscaling of air temperature here in northern Sakaya And you see that with the release of CO2 and methane we have globally today, after the red, you see the dark uh, line. This is the future increase in air temperature. We have to adapt. We need planning. And already we see that the rivers in Sakaya are affected. The rivers, as you see there on the, on the picture on the top, you see a car and you see actually a road. So the roads, the river roads in Sakaya are so important to keep the goods, uh, to, to bring the goods to the communities. Today you see that the rivers are freezing late and thawing early. A very final point is development, also in Sakya affecting indigenous people. This is the pipeline to China uh, as an example. Is it possible to adapt? We are going to discuss that in the future this week. Some communities are close to the tipping points. We could also discuss what a tipping point is. But natural resources and critical landscapes need protection. Tipping points for the uh, continuation of traditional livelihoods exist and in some areas may be passed in the next two decades. Therefore, protection of sustainable livelihoods is so important. But we have some resources. We will fix this. We are going to work hard. And to work out of Kennedy School, we have 30 students this week. The greatest resource is the indigenous youth with all the thinking and the confidence about traditional knowledge and the, the, the willing to invest in the future. We therefore conclude that adaptation to climate change demand training of local Arctic leaders in long-term sustainable thinking based on the best available adaptation knowledge, both scientific and experienced traditional knowledge. Thank you for your attention.